Welcome to our event this evening titled uh, Applying to Graduate School. This is the second event in our grad school prep series. The first event took place two weeks ago that was preparing for graduate school. And then we have another event next week, which is the final event in the series for this fall. And that is titled um, Writing a Personal Statement and Writing CVs. It's a workshop to teach you how to do both of those things, which are key elements in your application process for grad school. So I wanna start um, by introducing myself. My name is Dr. Carla Marquez Lewis. I am the director of the psychology program, and I will also be the moderator for this evening. I'll introduce our panel in just a moment. I wanted to first just cover a couple of housekeeping items. Um, tonight, we're gonna to ask that you post any of your questions in the chat feature or the Q&A section. You can post them while we're talking, or you can save them until the end of the event. We will also be moving into breakout rooms at the end of the event so that you can get some discipline specific questions answered. So please make sure to um, edit your name so that the number in front of your name corresponds with one of these breakout rooms that you see, um, nursing, psychology, youth studies, health information management, health services administration, disability studies, museum studies and RAC and business. If you are not in one of those, um, disciplines, feel free to just, you know, put the number of the one that's maybe closest to the area that you're interested in. And um, we'll hopefully be able to get your questions answered. And if you really feel like nothing's close, just let us know and we will direct uh, your information to the director of the program you're interested in and we'll make sure that they get in touch with you. So I want to start off just by saying that um, we're grateful that you're here today. The whole point of this series is really to help students. So we really wanna demystify the graduate school application process, which can be very confusing for people, especially people who don't know anyone that's ever graduated from um, grad school or applied to graduate school. It's not a very intuitive process. Um, and a lot of students that we've all talked to over the years have expressed the confusion that they have, the stress that they encounter, but more importantly, um, how, how disappointing the whole process can be after someone's through it. So they might feel like, oh, I wish I had known um, A, B, and C because I might've done things differently. So what we're here to do is really demystify the process, help untangle some of the things that might be confusing, and more importantly, to be a resource. So you can ask any questions that you have in a very safe environment where there's no impact on your application process and hopefully we'll get you all the information that you need. Um, so there are no silly questions, ask anything that you need to know and that's why we're here. So tonight we're gonna be covering um, deciding to apply to a graduate program and with the steps of the application process. And then what we're not going to be covering are the personal statements and the CVs, those very technical pieces, and we'll do that next week. So please come back um, because I think you're going to find that to be really helpful information. So let's go ahead and start with the basics. Um, so you have attended the event um, recently preparing for graduate school or one of the ones we, we've had in past years. We always do these in the fall. And so you've been preparing for a while and now you're at the point where you need to actually apply and decide where to apply. So our first question is going to start with what will graduate school entail? And then also how is it different from an undergraduate deg degree program? And um, let me introduce our panel members and then I'm going to turn it over to one of them specifically. So I'll ask them to wave um, or otherwise make themselves known. Um, Dr. Memory Danga is the associate, there she is, associate academic director for the Health Services Administration and Health Information Management Programs. Shanira Rojas is the academic program coordinator for the Youth Studies Program. Dr. Tara Barca, Academic Director for Online Business Programs. Dr. Patricia Bartley Danielli, Associate Professor and Graduate Nursing Education Program Coordinator for the Nursing Program. Dr. Isabel Alicia, Associate Director for the Psychology Programs. And Dr. Andrew Markham, Academic Director for the Disability Studies Programs. Hello, so everyone. Thank you to all of our panel members. So I'm gonna turn this one over to Dr. Patricia um, Bartley Danielli, and she's going to talk to you a little bit about um, the, the beginning stages. What, what's it like and how is it different from undergrad? 
Uh, so first of all, welcome everybody. Um, and you know, it's good that you attend uh, these sessions because um, it helps you with the timeline. When you really are looking at applying to a graduate program, uh, it is going from say a generalist in your baccalaureate education to more of a specialty orientation. So um, things that you should think about in terms of applying is, are the degrees and the concentrations um, of those programs reflective of where you are and where you want to be? Um, and then, you know, very concrete things, the number of credits, uh, what is the component in terms of a, either a capstone or a thesis? Are there also practicum in nursing? We call them practicum requirements where there's clinical practice hours that are needed in the specialty role. Um, at SPS, the three concentrations for the graduate program are nursing education, nursing leadership, and nursing informatics. In terms of what does it entail? Well, certainly I would say to you, especially with COVID, uh, there's been a transition to a lot of online learning um, and there are multiple supports uh, for, uh, again, at SPS, but certainly you should look into that as you're applying as if you have not been familiar with either a hybrid or online uh, um, environment. And then the other part really uh, supports what I said before. You are really looking to concentrate in a specialty role so uh, when you look at that, your assignments, often you're going to create uh, um, some of the assignments and use your interest uh, to meet the course and program requirements. So I would definitely say to you, reflect on where you are and where you want to be um, and look at where is it in terms of both your career um, and your uh, academic world as to what you want to focus. Um, again, certainly you want to make sure that you're applying to a program uh, and the credential that is being awarded uh, and degree um, that will prepare you for your future roles in your discipline. Wonderful, thank you. And can you talk a little bit more about um, the second part, which is, you know, how, how it's different from the undergrad program, how will graduate school be different than what students have already encountered? Well, I definitely would say um, that uh, there is a lot more independence and planning uh, in terms of your assignments uh, in uh, and again in in work life balancing. Uh, the students in grad school are adult learners with multiple responsibilities. Um, so often the tools are all there and the knowledge is there for you to utilize. The key to that success, though, is to be able to be proactive um, and um, kind of map it out. Uh, one, so that you can be successful and two, um, that you can maintain a balance between all your responsibilities. Great, thank you. Is there anyone else that wants to add anything um, to either of those questions? Dr. Alicia. Hi, I'd like to add simply that when you're an undergraduate uh, taking courses is your primary job. When you're a graduate student, you have to do a little bit more than that. So courses are the bare minimum. You have um, extensive research experience that may be part of the program. You also have, as Dr. Uh, Dr. Bartley Danielli said, practicums in certain fields. You may have internships in other fields. Um, and very often the expectation is that you're not just doing the work for your courses, but that you're actually actively cultivating certain skills so that you can then complete a thesis or a capstone or some sort of other major project that indicates that indicates mastery over your professional field. Great. So let's say that you've decided now to, to graduate or, or to apply to graduate school. You're certain this is the route that you wanna take. Um, you've 
thought about what it's going to entail, how it's different from undergrad, and, and you feel ready. So now the next step is really going to be, how do you choose a program? Um, and how do you choose a school? What are the things you should be looking for? How many programs should you choose? And, and how many should you apply to? So we want to talk a little bit about that so that you have that kind of information, which is really a, a big piece in, in the in the project um, or the process. So Dr. Isabel Alicia, I'm gonna turn it over to talk a little bit about identifying schools and programs. Thank you. Um, so the first thing I would say is make sure that the school you choose is accredited. That's a very, very big deal. Um, we, you may have heard a lot about, um, you know, certain um, scandals uh, and, you know, government forgiveness of loans to for-profit institutions, um, but we can't count on that. We want to start off by doing our research and making sure we're going to a school that provides us with the credentials that we actually want and that we can use in other places. So you want to make sure that you're going to a reputable school, a school that has its accreditation, and and a school that also will provide you with what you need specifically. So for example, if you're interested in studying, um, let's say counseling psychology, you want to go to a school that has a counseling psychology program. Not all, not all subfields of psychology give you the exact same credentials. So when you're doing your search, um, you can go, for example, to professional organizations in your field. So the American Psychological Association, for example, has lists of master's programs and doctorate programs in every subfield of psychology. And so you can see every program listed there. You can go to U.S. News and World Reports. You can go to a wide variety of different places to look just to see what are you know, accredited programs and recognized programs that are out there. Now, in terms of how to make a choice once you've seen the list, it's about um, being open-minded. That's the first thing. So you want to be open-minded in terms of, um, you know, not fixating just on one school, because sometimes that one school that you really, really wanted to go to may not offer you the same options that another school would offer you. So, for example, um, maybe you've dreamed all of your life of going to um, Columbia, but you applied and said you applied to Hunter and Hunter offered you more financial aid. And then, you know, Hunter becomes um, an event that uh, uh, becomes an institution that you um, are able to do a little, get a little bit more from, and that might be better for your particular um, options in, in life and in terms of your career choices. Now, how many programs you should choose? This is a tough one. Um, I we recently had the day in the life in psychology for developmental psychology, and our speaker applied to one doctoral program and was lucky enough to get into that one program. That is not often the case. So again, don't fixate on one program. Um, make a decision that you're going to apply to a handful and sometimes more. Um, there are some people who apply to 30 programs. I wouldn't suggest that. That's a lot of work. Um, but if you're but applying to four or five, that makes sense. And especially if you can get tuition waivers, that's something to it. Sorry, application waivers. So that's something you want to look into. Who will give you an application waiver? Are you eligible for an application waiver so that you have greater options in terms of where you are applying? In psychology and in other social sciences, um, just in general, in academia, when someone publishes a book or someone writes a paper um, or someone does some sort of project, they identify their, the institution they're going to. And so what you might want to do is pay attention to where people are. So if there's someone who is doing really exciting work at City College, apply to City College and in your application, you know, think about the possibility of working with this person. So look to see who's at a particular program, look at the program page, study the program page, and then make your decision and apply. And again, accreditation, possibilities for application fee waivers, all of those should be part of your identification of where to apply process. Dr. Alicia, um, we have a an audience member who posed the question, do you mean different programs in different schools or different programs in the same school? So typically a school will not allow you to apply to more than one pro, some, well, it depends on the school. There are some schools that will not allow you to apply to more, more than one program in the school in one academic year. Um, I have heard of rare cases where schools will say, oh, well, you're interested in these two topics, you can apply to both. But very often it's considered, you know, 
bad protocol to apply to more than one program in a particular school. So what I'm talking about is different programs in different schools. Um, and again, because you want to show a commitment to a particular field. So if you are applying to SPS, for example, you don't want to apply to youth studies, disability studies, um, HIM and psychology all at the same time. Well, we don't allow that. That's the first thing. But you also don't want to do that because it doesn't look very good for you. And we would obviously see it um, through, admi through um, admissions records. Great. Thanks. And, and to clarify, I mean, I think in, and Dr. Alicia, you can, um, it, you know, expand on this if you want, but one of the reasons it doesn't look great is because by the time you get to be a, a student applying to graduate school, there's an idea and an expectation that you know, or at least have some clear idea of what you want to do um, and what area you're particularly interested in. So if you are suddenly interested in this, 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 it, it makes it look like you're not actually very clear on what it is that you want to do or that you're not quite ready for graduate school and that you need a little more time to figure out exactly what it is you want to do. Dr. Alicia, do you want to add anything to that? Yes, thank you. So yes, you're training to be a specialist in your area, whether you're getting a master's, so master's that's showing mastery over the air, over um, that particular field, or you're getting a doctorate, uh, you're planning on hoping to get a doctorate. Um, again, you're considered a professional, you're at a higher level. It's not uh, an issue of, you know, going with whatever you're interested in. It's about figuring out where you're going to be proficient, where you're going to have expertise, and where you're going to focus uh, your attention. And so, you know, divided attention doesn't look very good in the when you're in the process of applying. And um, again, we the school will find out if you're applying to more than one program at one particular school. Great, thank you. So let's talk a little bit about once you've decided um, what program you'd like to attend, or at least a, a handful or more um, programs, and you've decided and thought a little bit about how to choose the programs, which to choose, sometimes you will encounter programs that have particular pre-admission courses. So those are um, courses that you need to have taken before you apply to the program or you can apply to the program and then you have to take them usually as part of some conditions. Um, so what should someone do if there are pre-admission courses that are required for a program? I will turn that over to um, Dr. Jenga to um, talk a little bit about this. So in terms of uh, pre-admission courses, it takes a lot of planning as one of my colleagues has mentioned before. So depending on when you plan to enroll, I would encourage you to complete as many prereqs as you can prior to applying only because graduate school can be very demanding, but students can apply in, and some programs might admit the students uh, on the contingency that they can complete those prereqs within a certain period, period of time. This is especially the case in terms of if the student doesn't have the uh, bachelor's degree background that's compared to the to the graduate school that they, they are applying to. So sometimes the school the uh, program might allow you to apply and complete those uh, prereqs when you are already enrolled. But I, I'll let my colleagues um, share their thoughts on that. Thank you. Can, can you talk, um, Dr. Denga, a little bit about your program specifically and in, in terms of uh, of health information management, the masters in health information management, we accept uh, students. We have prerequisites that students can take when they are already enrolled. So we actually do accept students and allow them to take uh, like prereqs, but those we we kind of call them core requisites because you can take them while you're already admitted. Um, we do that mostly for those students that are coming in without an HIM background. So we allow them to catch up to, to the other classes that they haven't taken, like biology, um, statistics, and things like that. So we in, in my program, we actually have five uh, prereqs that you, you should take for your master's program. Wonderful. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add anything about pre-admission courses, maybe for their program specifically and how those work? Uh, Dr. Markham. Sure. So I think it's important to, to remember that pre-admissions courses are 
or opportunities are going to vary from program to program. So you really need to, that's a question you need to ask about the program that you're applying to, is what pre-admission opportunities are available to me. Some programs will allow you to audit a course. Like in our program, for example, we have a foundational course, which is Disability Studies 601, I believe. And we'll allow a prospective student to audit that course and help them, and that'll help them determine if it's the right program for them. Um, we also offer certificates and advanced certificates. And the advanced certificates in our program, you basically take the core main courses of our graduate program, uh, but you don't do all the extra work that comes with electives and the research projects and all of that. So the advanced certificate is something that you can do to advance our, uh, as a credential for your career, but also it will let you know if the master's degree is right for you, right? If you wanna go beyond their certificate, and secure a master's degree. So that's another uh, that's another option for in a lot of places. But the main point I wanted to make is just that it, it will vary. So one of the questions you want to ask when you're looking at a program is, what are the pre-course options for me? Are there pre-course options? And if so, what are they? Thank you, Dr. Alicia. So in psychology, across the board, uh, there are three required courses uh, for uh, in terms of pre-admission courses. Typically, you're going to be required to take research methods um, or experimental psychology. That would be another name for research methods. Um, you would also be required to take introduction to psychology. General psychology is sometimes the name, um, particularly at certain community colleges. And then you're also going to be required to take social science statistics or psychological statistics or statistics for social sciences. There are a variety of different names. Um, now, this is going to be whether you're applying to a master's program or to a doctoral program. In some cases, you may also be required to take for example, theories of personality course, you that's PsyD programs usually require theories of personality courses, and um, you may be required to take developmental psychology or some other course that is reflective of the specialization that you're thinking of going into. Here at SPS, we have a pre-admission system uh, to pre uh, pre-admission course system that um, allows you to have basically a um, you to take the pre-admission courses. Um, and you're conditionally admitted to the master's degree program with the idea that if you complete these courses successfully and meet the requirements that are set for your completion of these three courses, you will then be able to take master's level courses and be fully in the master's program after you've completed uh, research methods, statistics, and um, introduction psychology and obtained um, at least a B in those courses. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to make an important clarification because there's two different things that Dr. and Alicia and I are talking about. One is prerequisites, that is the required courses that you have to have completed to be, you know, considered for admissions. And the other is like which courses you can take or opportunities to take courses that might help you in, in before you enter the program or you know, before you commit to the full-scale thing. Uh, does everybody understand that distinction? Because I think there's, there's, there might be some confusion around that. When we say pre-admission, it seems like we're, we're talking about, there's prerequisites for some programs, right? And the, which are required courses, but then there's also things like we do in our program where we give a student an opportunity to audit a course. Those are different things. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you for that clarification. Yeah, I think in the context of this, we were thinking about it more as required courses that a, a, a student would be required to have taken um, before applying to a program. But it's good to, to also identify that there are also other things that, that students should do or could do um, yeah. to help them I as well. I think I was reading pre-admission in a different context. Mm -hmm. maybe than others were reading it. So, because the, there's required courses and then there's courses that you can take before you are admitted, at least in our program there. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bartley Daniele, you had your um, hand up. I, I also wanted to highlight um, in terms of nursing, you know, and again, depending on when you graduated, uh, there are courses that are required of all nursing students. So, for example, advanced health assessment 
you would have to have an undergraduate uh, health assessment course. And the same thing as Dr. Alicia said, in terms of psychology, there's an advanced statistics course in the graduate nursing program for all majors, you would need an undergraduate statistics course. So uh, we have admitted people conditionately with the caveat that they complete the, the undergraduate courses before full admission uh, into the graduate nursing program. Uh, but I also wanted to point out that um, the uh, student can choose to take that course outside of SPS as long as it meets requirements, but that does involve a little bit of legwork to make sure. Um, and I would say that the students who have come to SPS as conditional admits in the nursing program, 95% of them took the uh, undergraduate course that they were missing and were successful and then easily transitioned for a full admit into the nursing program. So again, it emphasizes the importance of time and um, planning when you do apply to uh, graduate school. Yes, and, and I'd also wanna add a, a couple of people have mentioned in the chat or asked in the chat, you know, how do they know which pre-admission courses they're going to need? Um, how, how would they find out um, what they are? Um, for every program that you're applying to, if you go to the admissions, um, the admissions um, process page, it will have the information that you need to apply to that program. Within that information, it will tell you which courses are required um, for you to have completed before you apply to the program or um, that you can apply to the program and then you'd have to finish them within a certain amount of time as Dr. Um, Danga mentioned earlier. So it's gonna be different per program. So someone asked about STEM programs and it depends on which STEM program. It also depends on which school because for at psych, you know, for psychology at SPS, we have pre-admission courses, but it's not going to always be the same three. It's likely going to be those three, but not the, not necessarily the same three at every single school. So you really, that's where your individualized research as another colleague said really comes into play. Um, Dr. Barca, you wanted to add? I just wanted to add that um, in addition to, if you go to the admissions page, when you click on our individual program pages to see all the details, there's always a link for the full curriculum. And if you click there, you can see the admission requirements there and, and it lists it. For our program, the Master of Science in Business Management and Leadership, you may need to take up to three courses. They're undergraduate courses in financial accounting, statistics, micro or macroeconomics, and computer applications. But we, we determine that as part of a degree audit. Once we received your application, we'll look at your transcripts and all of your documentation uh, to determine if you need to take those courses or not. Great, thank you. I wanted to just uh, quickly just uh, pause for a second. If um, you go to the, the three little uh, dots that are at the top right-hand corner of your name, um, there'll be a drop down, And one of those at the very bottom says rename. And if you click that, you can actually edit your name. And if you can put the number before your name, um, so I'll do it for my name. For example, I'd go to, and I would add like, let's say a two, and you'll see suddenly my name's gonna change to the number two. That's how we'll know which breakout room to put you in. So if you can do that, um, instead of putting them in the chat, it, it makes it a lot faster um, when we get to the breakout uh, rooms to be able to do that. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I, I do want to ask one question because this, um, someone asked, they're, they're only available to stay until seven. Will this be available again? They intend to apply for the fall 2023 master's program. So we only offer this series in the fall. Um, we do it every fall. So this will be the last time you would see it before you would apply if you were applying for fall 2023. So I just wanted to note that. Okay, so let's shift back. Um, thank you everyone for, for this wonderful conversation about pre-admission courses, because they are, it can be really confusing. So I think this is useful information. Um, we wanted to switch gears just a little bit and talk about another key piece of the application process that gets very confusing very quickly um, for applicants, which is transcripts. So um, 
Shanira Rojas is going to talk to us a little bit about which transcripts people need to provide and then how and when do you get them? Thank you so much. So basically all applicants are required to submit official transcripts from all colleges and universities attended. So say if you went to two colleges for your undergrad, you would need to provide both of those transcripts. Even if you've done some like advanced certificates or certificate programs, those uh, transcripts would also be required. And it's pretty easy. You just have to go to your registrar's office from your previous institution to request them. And it has to be sent from the school in an official sealed envelope. Uh, schools cannot accept um, an unofficial transcript. Um, but if you are a CUNY undergrad, usually it's a they, there's a platform called uh, Parchment that can send over your transcript for no charge. Um, if it's going from one CUNY to another CUNY. Um, so that is a pretty easy way to get all your paperwork um, into your application and ready to go. Great. Uh, here's a couple of questions that anyone, uh, uh, one of our panelists, including um, Shanira can take. A, it's, uh, do you need transcripts if you're applying to an SPS graduate program? And then someone also asked, um, are you able to take e-transcripts from the registrar of a non-CUNY? Anyone want to take either of those questions? Um, I think for the first one was asking about, uh, do we need transcript from SPS to SPS? That's what it sounds like to me, yeah. Um, I believe that the, the admissions can just pull it because that's what I've been told in the past. Um, because it's just an SPS, but I would always just always make sure you get clarification. But remember, if you do need to get, uh, if you do need to do a formal request because it's CUNY to CUNY, there will be no charge. And for the e-transcripts, I mean, I've seen a lot of folks um, get their transcripts um, electronically from another institution, as long as it's sent to our admissions email from the other institution, from their registrar office, you should be okay. Great. And someone asked, do you need high school transcripts? Dr. Barca? Um, sure. I just wanted to add, um, we don't accept transcripts emailed from the potential student. So make sure that it's emailed directly from the institution. Um, for our program, we do not require high school transcripts, um, to my understanding. Is that correct, Carla? Is that across the board? It's mm -hmm. just under, any undergraduate or graduate study? Just undergrad. Right. And I mean, in my personal opinion, for me, uh, when I'm submitting an application, even if I'm an SPS student now, I would request that those transcripts be sent just to dot all my I's and cross all my T's to make sure that everything is in order. Yeah, and someone asked a question about um, about whether or not they need transcripts from um, AP classes or college now classes. Um, that's a great question. So I would talk to the admissions office of the program that you're applying to. Some of them will take, if you, let's say that you're um, coming from a CUNY campus, you're coming from Lehman and you're applying to SPS. So Lehman on their transcript, they will have your transferred um, credits from your high school. So AP or um, College Now noted in that transcript. So a lot of times SPS won't require you to produce original transcripts because those were already assessed when you came into, um, when you went into Lehman. So it's usually not necessary, but I would just verify that with whatever admissions office as Shanira noted, because you just don't want to be um, caught without what you need. Um, Dr. Alicia, you wanted to add something? And then I'll, and then Dr. Barca. Yeah, sometimes students use AP psychology as a AP psychology as a means of um, having a waiver so they don't have to take introduction to psychology at the college level. And in that particular case, it should be on your undergraduate tra uh, transcript um, that AP psychology was accepted as a replacement for introduction to psychology. So I'm reemphasizing something Dr. Marquez Lewis already said, which is that your college transcript, transcript should indicate um, any um, courses that you came in and received uh, credit for um, that you took as a, as a um, high school student. Great. Dr. Barca? 
Uh, I just wanted to address a question about applying for an SVS master's program while they're completing an undergrad program. Um, you can certainly begin the application, uh, but it won't be complete until you are officially finished with the BA or the BS. But I would encourage you to get the application started um, and then fulfill that last requirement. You can certainly begin your application and then submit it once you have that degree in hand. Great. Our next area for discussion is a very important one, uh, letters of recommendation. It's also the most confusing. So a lot of times students don't know how to go about um, getting letters of recommendation. I can tell you that one of the ways you don't want to do it, um, and then Dr. Alicia can tell you uh, how you do. Um, as someone write, who writes a lot of letters of recommendation, um, you don't want to just receive a notification from a school um, that says you have been, uh, you know, chosen as a reference for enter student's name, please, you know, letter upload your letter here. Um, that's that's a surprise, um, and it, it's not the the proper way to go about doing it. So, Dr. Leash is going to talk a little bit about this very key area, which is how do you obtain a letter of recommendation and who should write them and what's the protocol um, for going about getting one? Okay, so thank you so much for highlighting the way not to do it. I got one of those surprises um, earlier today. And very often what faculty will do is they'll ignore them. And that's what you don't want. You want faculty to acknowledge the request for a letter of recommendation. And so the way to get them to acknowledge it is to reach out to them personally. So send an email to the faculty member or to the supervisor, you know, reach out to your for a former supervisor because you can use professional letters. It has to be someone who was, um, who's actually knows your work and supervised your work if it's a professional letter or reach out to a faculty member, someone who taught you is the best option. You can ask your advisor, but if your advisor didn't have you in class, um, there are certain things that your advisor can't speak to. and my suggestion is start off by approaching the person via email, letting them know you're thinking about going to graduate school. Information I usually require, I'd like to know what the student has been doing since the student left the course. If you just left the course the semester before, then obviously you're not going to tell me, yes, I'm taking four other courses or I'm still an undergrad. But if you have, if we haven't spoken in two, three years, give me an update on what you've been up to professionally and also tell me which programs you're applying for what the deadlines are, and I'd also like to know what your professional goals are uh, when you ask for a letter of recommendation. Um, there are other faculty who have, I've heard of faculty having, you know, a series of five, six questions that they ask students to answer or asking them to provide, you know, to provide a copy of the personal statement. Um, there's a wide variety of different requirements that individual faculty members may have or individual rec potential recommenders may have, but the most important thing is that you trust that whoever you've asked to write you a letter is going to write you a solid letter. So that means asking someone in whose class you got a good grade, asking someone whom you've had a conversation with. If you took the course with, with, a, with a person and you never had a conversation with the faculty member, you never attended office hours, you never sent, you never exchanged emails, that can be a little bit tricky because sometimes they want more specificity and more details that go beyond just your having taken a multiple choice quiz or some sort of exam and the person doesn't really know anything about you and can't really speak to the strength, uh, your strengths as a student. You want someone who can really speak to your strengths as a student. So start preparing, go to office hours, um, you know, be attentive, uh, participate actively in class. And also when you ask for the letter, make sure you're asking for someone who has something good to say about you and not from someone in whose class you got a low grade, for example. Um, there are cases where you got a low grade, but the person knows you really well and can explain why you got a low grade, um, but those um, sometimes are a little bit rare. So, you know, start preparing early and think about who would be appropriate. Approach the person prior to putting the person down as a recommender. Ask for permission to put them down as a recommender, and also waive your right to look at the letter. Um, I, uh, have dealt with students who do not waive their right to look at the letter. It's not comfortable as a faculty member to see that the student absolutely wants to look at the record. And also programs don't view that positively. Sometimes they see it as the faculty member is going to write a letter that is more 
friendly to you and less detailed because they know you're going to be looking at it and they don't want to hurt your feelings. So my suggestion is waive your rights and um, make sure you're asking someone whom you trust to say something good about you. So Dr. Alicia, here's a question, and I think this is a great question um, that was asked in the chat. So actually there's two versions of it, um, but one is about whether or not you should get new letters if the letters are several years old. And then someone else asked whether or not you should you could use recommendation letters that a professor wrote a couple of years ago when they applied to something else. So, you're, so the first thing is you should not use old letters. If a letter was written five years ago, hopefully you've done a lot of other things in your life in the past five years. Um, and you know the five-year-old letter won't necessarily speak to that. If the letter is, so for example, there's there are different systems for uploading general letters of recommendation and they can then be used. If the letter is two years old or three years old, um, you know, that's a little borderline, but if it's a year old, you can absolutely use it. Two years sometimes is a good idea as well. Um, it depends on what you're applying, what field you're applying for, and it also depends on how many letters are requested. So if, for example, there's three letters required, but you have the option to use five, then you could use three that were written specifically for the particular program you are applying for. And then you could send two optional ones, just if you know that they are great statements that indicate that you're a good student and that you have a good character, so good support letters. But my suggestion is use letters that are recent, letters that are specific to what you're currently applying for. They don't have to just be specifically for that school or that program. They could just be general letters um, in support of your application to let's say a, a, a um, master's program in um, IO psychology or something of that sort. So they could be a general letter because we do understand that uh, sometimes you're applying to seven programs and it's hard for faculty to write seven different letters at times. It's uh, so, yeah, we understand general letters, but again, recent is better and the more tailored, the better. And Dr. Alicia, one, one more thing. Could you talk a little bit about how, how much lead time um, should you give your faculty member for a letter? Thank you, yes. Um, so I would say the minimum would be, should be, the minimum should be at least a month. Um, you, so, it's very rare that you just suddenly decide you're applying and you need the letter within the, re the week. Um, usually you should be doing some sort of preparation ahead of time, looking at deadlines. So if you are thinking about applying to graduate school right now, um, hopefully you're thinking about applying not with the idea that you're going to um, you know, get a letter immediately that is due in uh, November, but instead with the idea that you are going to get a letter that's due in two, three months. Um, very often people are busy and they just don't have that much time. Um, so if you give them as much space and time as possible, that's helpful. And if you also send a reminder, but not too many reminders, that's a good thing. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I received reminders every hour on the hour uh, for writing a particular letter. That didn't feel very good. So you don't want to put too much pressure on the faculty member. And that's one of the reasons to put the deadlines in the email asking for the letter. So if you list, let's say you list three programs you're applying to and you have the deadline for submission of the letter next to the name of each program, that's a great way to go about things. And you can send a reminder, but don't do it every hour on the hour and don't do it after one week, give the person time. So I, three weeks would be the bare minimum for courtesy, um, but preferably a month or two months just to give uh, the person time. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember that we want to write the most detailed letters we can for you. Um, so, you know, giving us more time gives us an opportunity to do that. And it's also um, it's also good when a student, I personally I don't mind when students reach out and say, I'm thinking of applying to, to grad schools next semester, and I wanted to know, or even next year, and I want to know if you'd consider being... Um, you know, writing a letter for me. It's nice to get the heads up. And usually what I say is here's the five or six questions. Um, if you can answer these and then send them back to me with your personal statement with at least three to four weeks um, advance notice, then I'd be happy to, to write your letters. And then I know in the back of my mind, I put it in my little 
letters of recommendation file that someone's going to be coming to me, you know, in, in a year and asking for these. And I, and I've already given them my yes. Um, other people want to add, we'll go, um, Dr. Bark, I saw your hand up and then Dr. Markham. Sure, I just want to address some questions in the chat about, you know, getting letters from, uh, in professional setting, which it depends on the program. Um, for us, you know, we want to see, we would like to see at least one letter from a superior at your job because we're looking for professional experience that can apply to your graduate level work. Um, so someone else asked about, you know, recommending from professors. I would say one and one for our program would be good. One from a faculty member, one from um, your superior at work. The uh, major component is to consider, do not ask a friend to write a letter for you um, and do not, you know, entertain the idea of a coworker. We're really looking for somebody who has directly supervised your work, whether it's in a professional setting or an academic setting. Dr. Markham. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Barker um, actually addressed some of what I was going to say because I was waiting for someone to ask that question in the chat box and I'm glad it popped up because, you know, we have a lot of students who are a long way away from their undergraduate by the time they decide to apply for graduate school. So you might have finished your graduate uh, undergraduate degree 10 years ago. And it's in it's what Dr. Alicia said earlier, if that's the case, you need to try to reconnect with a professor from that time, reacquaint them with what you're doing. Um, but you would also want to um, focus on those professional relationships that you have with people who have supervised your work, as Dr. Barker was saying, because um, we do get letters all the time from um, family and friends, and we just can't accept those. They don't give us a, an accurate sense of what your work is and what you've accomplished. And if you've been out of school for a, a long time and don't have, are not able to reestablish those connections, maybe um, you, you're going to have to lean on the professional relationship. So you want to make sure that you have um, those, uh, those lined up. You can get into most programs with a professional reference. And if you're able to get a, a scholarly reference as well, that's, that's, that's the ideal. But some students may not, may have a real difficulty doing that if they've been out of school for a really long time. But I wouldn't let that discourage you. I would just review the program's guidelines and see what they expect. And um, if you have questions, reach out to the to a graduate advisor in their program and ask them, "Hey, here's my situation. Um, what do you need to know from me, and what do you need from a letter of recommendation, and and what do you expect? You know." Just to be clear, there's nothing wrong with asking before you put in the, the application. Great advice. So one of the big areas um, in terms of um, intimidation, I think for some students is or are the exams that come with applying to some graduate programs. So I wanna just put this out to all of our panelists um, and just, if you can just, you know, quickly um, in, you know, very brief um, response, whether or not your program requires any particular exams um, for entry. We do not in disability studies. Business does not. HIM does not. Nursing does not, um, but there is a GPA requirement of a 3.0. Youth studies does not. Same for psychology. We do not require any exams, but we do have a 3.0 GPA cutoff. I will echo on the GPA. It's also a 3.0 for the HIM program. That's the, that's the same for our program as well. 3.0 is, is the foundational GPA. Mm -hmm. The but that we say might... it's not a hard cutoff. That experience ma experience matters, and we do understand that sometimes uh, life happens and it comes at you very quickly, and that you're a different person maybe five years later. So you can justify exam scores and your GPA in your letter, and we'll talk about that next time. Mm -hmm. And in terms of exams, oftentimes what you hear about is the um, the GRE 
um, is, is one that you might have heard floating around. Um, the GRE exam is not required um, the way it used to be required. There are a lot of reasons for this, but um, one of them is that research has shown that it is not as predictive of success in graduate school as people used to think that the um, exams were normed on uh, a particular population um, and didn't account for much diversity. So um, there's a lot of issues with these exams. And I think a lot of schools have recognized that and as such have kind of done away with them. Um, but that doesn't mean that they aren't required at the other programs that you may be applying to. So make sure again, to go to that section about um, the admissions requirements. It will say there if the GRE or the, you know, whatever the, the series of exams are, there's a, a ton of them um, for graduate school if you need that um, for your program. But at SPS, we don't we don't have it. Um, Dr. Markham, you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing, which is when I applied for the, P the PhD program that I completed uh, several years ago, they did require a GRE. And what I want to say about the GRE is that you might have to take it multiple times to get the score that meets the minimum requirements for multiple programs. So as we've made clear, we those of us here, we don't require those scores, but many programs do. And I just want to assure everybody, if you do want to get into a program that does require an exam, prepare for the exam, use a study guide. If you don't get the score that meets the minimum, don't be discouraged. Do it again, because you can boost your score. You often have to wait a time period before you can retake an exam, but you, you can take it multiple times. Yes. And, and if you don't do well, uh, as Dr. Markham notes, don't get discouraged. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're out um, at graduate school. Um, I know plenty of people who did not do well on the GRE back when the GRE was required almost everywhere, and they still successfully managed to get into programs based on research experience, personal statements, grades, et, et cetera. Um, so it's just one component, um, even if it is required. Um, so... Let's go ahead and move on to the um, the interviews. Another intimidating um, area for folks who are applying. So that last slide just said personal statements and was just a reminder that we'll be talking about those next week. But in terms of interviews, um, the questions are, do all programs require an interview? And then how do you prepare for an interview for graduate school? So I'm gonna pass this on to Dr. Markham um, for his expertise. Okay, so the answer to the first question is is no, not all programs will require an interview, especially at the master's level. Um, if a program does require an interview and you've made it all the way to the point where you're getting an interview, that's pretty good news for you. That means you've made it through a couple of the, the, the hard things and presumably it means you've also familiarized yourself with the program. You, you submitted an application that was compelling enough to convince the, the admissions committee that you're a viable candidate, you know why you want to be there, you know why you want to be in the program. All that being said is that the most important thing to do before you go into an interview is to re-familiarize yourself with everything you've learned about the program and also to re-familiarize yourself with your own application. Now that may sound a little bit strange, but if you're going into an interview situation, it's going to be stressful. You're going to be nervous. So one of the most important ways that you can manage that, that nervousness, which is perfectly normal, is to, rem is to re refresh your memory on what did I say in my personal statement? What did I write in my, um, you know, in my application? And why did I choose this program? And what are my goals? And the reason you want to ask yourself those questions and be prepared to answer them is because that's going to be what the interview comes from. The interview is going to be based on your application and questions that the committee is going to have about your application, about what your goals are. Why did you choose our program? Why do you think this program is a good option for you? Uh, what do you want to achieve in the program? So you can't anticipate every question. There's no way to do that. You don't know what the questions are going to be, but you can anticipate that what you said in your application is going to prompt questions and will be the basis for the questions that you're asked. So you want to make sure that you've re you're very familiar with your application, 
you're also familiar with the program and with the with the program's website. Uh, hopefully, you've taken the time to, and hopefully, you've had the opportunity to talk with somebody that has completed the program. And ideally, if you can, somebody that's in the program, as well as a faculty member that serves in the program, because that's going to give you the best perspective and information. You need to, before you even reach out to people to familiarize yourself with the program, though, you need to do your homework so that you have specific questions that you're able to ask them. You don't just want to go to somebody and say, tell me about the program, because then you, you want to make sure that you have specific questions that they can address. Right. Um, the other thing I would say in terms of preparing for the interview is to to understand what your programs and your field's expectations are. What are the professional expectations of the field that you are trying to enter into and get educated in? Because some graduate programs will require you to or expect you not necessarily even require, but res but expect you to, you know, publish something in a peer review journal, or they may require you to do field work and community based work. So you want to be familiar with what those uh, requirements and expectations are, and be prepared to say that you're ready to meet them. Um, I think um, also going to the point about you know, knowing yourself and your application, be be ready to answer questions that might come up about, you know, you've been out of school for a while. You did a great you did a great job explaining what you've been doing since you left school. Could you talk a little bit more about that experience? You know, be prepared to say and and elaborate on what you've put in your application in terms of things that you know, you know, hey, I got kind of a low GPA. They might ask me about that. I'm, I'm prepared to answer that and I'm comfortable with it um, because I know that I'm ready for this program. And then finally, just some practical nuts and bolts things, you know, um, <clears throat> make sure that whether you're doing a virtual or an in-person uh, interview, that you're addressed in a way that's professional, that you're also comfortable with that you feel confident with. In a virtual interview, for example, you'd never want to put on your, your sweatpants and your comfortable clothes to do an interview. You wanna put on your interview clothes just as if you were going in person because you wanna be in that professional mindset. You, know? um, you also want to make sure that you've, you don't have an empty stomach and that you don't, um, you know, need to use the bathroom, or you need you need to make sure that you are that you are not going to be distracted by the things that all happen with our bodies, right? So having a glass of water, making sure that you you've um, eaten well that day and slept well the night the night before, and you're taking care of yourself, you know, uh, all of those things you may not think are important, but they are very important for you to do an interview successfully. Um, even the most articulate, confident, extroverted people are going to be nervous in an interview situation. And I'm an introverted person. I get very, very nervous sometimes speaking, even though I have a lot of experience of doing it. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm aware of the things I need to do to prepare myself and my body in advance of an interview. Great. Thank you. The last area that we want to talk about is um, one that is is a little less um, easy to to sort of pinpoint. Um, it's something called fit, and you'll hear people talk about fit a lot. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Barca to talk about this sort of vague thing called fit. What role does what is it? Maybe first. And what role does FIT play in the admissions process? And is there anything that a student can do to make their FIT for the program more apparent to the admissions committee? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add one note about the interview. You know, it's always a good idea to practice. Sometimes we just kind of go into it, but practice, even if with a friend, a family member, a coworker, in front of the mirror, 
whether that's for a graduate application or job, as you get, as you practice actually going through like a mock interview, you'll be more comfortable. Uh, so let's get to the role of fit. Fit is one of my favorite topics. So I'm sorry if I go on a bit longer about this, but the fit is to me is extremely important in the uh, graduate school planning and application process. So what is fit? It's generally the suitability of one thing to another. So as you weigh out your options of the schools and the programs that interest you, it's really important to consider fit, how you'll fit into the school and the program, how the curriculum will fit into what you'd like to study, and how that degree fits into your future goals. Um, in considering fit, remember that there are no two graduate programs that are alike. Although degrees may have the same title, the program focus, course sequencing, the curriculum, the professors, and the school itself will make each degree unique. So we want to look at fit because a high level of fit ensures alignment between the student, the institution, and the program, and that results in a dynamic and robust partnership. So when uh, to max and maximizing the effectiveness of your planning, your application, and your success as a student, there are two types of fit that I like to talk about when you're that you should demonstrate in your application. So the first type is applicant institution fit. And this is where you think about whether you and the school are a good match for one another. You wanna ask yourself questions like, why am I interested in pursuing my graduate degree at this particular school, as opposed to other schools? What makes the school unique and can I thrive there? It's definitely important for you to understand what this school expects, what they care about, and what they're seeking in applicants. Uh, definitely thoroughly research and understand your target school's history, the mission, vision, values, admissions criteria, and ask yourself, do I share the school's values? Do I really believe in its mission and vision? And how can I contribute to the success of the school as a graduate student? You also want to research the size of the school, the makeup of the student body, extracurricular groups, activities, events, community partnership opportunities. It's really important that your identity as a graduate school student includes a sense of belonging, uh, definitely an opportunity to make contributions outside of the classroom. Um, also ask yourself, how are my experiences, my values, characteristics, and my goals similar and different from those of the institution? And how might those similarities and differences affect my overall graduate school experience? So that's what you want to think about for applicant institution fit. The next is applicant program fit. And that's when you're thinking about whether you're a good fit for the particular program, whether the program is a good fit for you. So you first want to identify programs that fit your interests along with your academic and your professional goals. Research each program's admission criteria the program mission, the general focus, the full curriculum, and think about how your KSAs, your knowledge, your skills, and your abilities, your professional experience, and your qualities, along with your um, academic and your research interests align with the program mission and the focus. So really make sure that the curriculum is in line with what you want to learn. Is there anything missing that you value that's important to your education? You may want to map out your ideal course sequence for each program. And if you spend some time thinking about how the sequence addresses your interests, you'll soon see which program's curriculum is the best fit for you. Um, finally, when it comes to the applicant program fit, you wanna consider how achieving this degree when you reach that finish line from a particular program will fit into your future. Think about how the program could help you to achieve your goals and your dreams and research where uh, alumni from a program go on to work or to study think about you know will the program help you to build a skill set or an area of expertise that will give you a competitive advantage in your career so when you're preparing your application remember that a lack of knowledge about the target institution and the program can negatively impact your application you definitely want to clearly and authentically explain why you're a good fit for the institution and the program and use concrete examples You'll typically include those in your personal statement, your resume, and an interview if required. And this is a good tip that your recommender could also identify why you're a good fit in their letters of recommendation. Uh, definitely avoid statements that reflect this generic approach to the application process, or if you're unfamiliar with the school and the program to which you're applying, that never looks good. 
And that, you know, those kinds of statements signal that you haven't made an honest effort to learn about the school and the program. Um, really consider that graduate school requires a large investment of your effort, your time, your money. So it's crucial that you conduct due diligence to ensure that your selected school and program are the best fit for you and that you are the best fit for the school and the program. And a final thought about fit. So academic requirements and coursework are only one piece of the graduate school experience. The ultimate goal is to find a school and a program that will allow you to create a holistic experience throughout your graduate school journey that best fits your unique needs, characteristics, and your aspirations. Thank you. I wanna end by talking about um, something very sort of general, but from a lot of people who sat on admissions committees and um, can lend their expertise to this area. So if each person can just say maybe sort of briefly, um, just in the interest of time, um, what are admissions committees looking for? Um, or if you wanna personalize it, you can even mention what you particularly look for as an admissions committee member. Um, Dr. Alicia, can we start with you? Yes, and I'm going to personalize this. I'm very excited about students who um, understand that psychology is an evidence-based field and are interested in doing research. Um, I think that, you know, very much there's so many options um, in terms of clinical fields. Unfortunately, that's not what we specialize in at SPS. Um, we have an IO program, we have a developmental program, and those are research-based. So I'm excited when you mention research and mention an appreciation of research in your application. Great. Dr. Markham. Um, I, I want to see someone who demonstrates a self-awareness of why they're applying to the program, why they chose the program, um, why they feel they're going to be a good fit for it. Um, and um, I think it's been emphasized before, but just to emphasize it again, when you talk about things like test scores or GPAs or even letters of recommendation, those are all components of an application. And you wanna do your best to do your best in each one of those components, but don't be discouraged if you have a weakness in one component or another. Emphasize your strengths, emphasize your abilities, and, and let the, the admissions committee know why it is that you're a good fit, even though uh, you don't have the perfect application, because very few people do have a perfect application. But if you know why it is that you're applying, why this school's a good fit for you, and you communicate that to the admissions committee, I think, I think that's going to help you a lot. Great. Dr. Barca. So in business, it's definitely important to present yourself professionally. Um, as my current students know, you know, proofread, 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 spell check, grammarly, um, have other people read everything before you submit, make sure there's no errors. And for, for us, we're really in the, in the business, uh, the MSBML, we're, we're looking for people to tell us what their future goals are. You know, why are you really seeking this degree? This is not the end of the road. So what, how can we help you to achieve your dreams? Um, I, we consider our students to be scholar practitioners. You know, we're partners with our students. So we wanna see that in your applications about why, you're, why you wanna to come to us for a degree in particular, and what are you looking to do with that degree throughout the program and after? Great, Ms. Rojas. So for youth studies, um... I think particularly, I'm looking for someone who's passionate, right? Someone who wants to use this program to advance their career, but also um, help the field of youth development, right? To become more professionalized. Um, thinking about the ways they can use their work in the their time in the program to help improve um, design of programs, uh, running programs, research and youth studies programs. And Dr. Jenga. I'm looking for someone who demonstrate that they are aware of the profession because HIM is definitely founded on the professional association. So I just want to be able to understand that someone is aware of those kind of things and what's expected in the industry and they are prepared for the challenge um, 
within the profession and what their intentions are in terms of getting the degree and then what. So I want to be able to see that um, in the application. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you all, uh, all our, our panelists. I, I just, uh, for nursing. Oh, oh sorry, Dr. Bartley Daniele. Yeah, I'm sorry, I said you. Go ahead. I would say, in terms of the admissions com committee, we really look to see if uh, both as a nurse and um, in undergraduate education that they were actively engaged. So, things certainly in terms of community volunteer activities, uh, uh, a school involvement. Um, and since the uh, applicants uh, for the graduate program are nurses, not just say their specialty and their location of where they work, but if there's been any initiatives or quality improvement, what was their co contribution to advance that? I would definitely say that that is looked upon as um, a very strong uh, criteria because again, they're uh, moving from a generalist to a specialist uh, with graduate nursing ed. Great, thank you. And thank you all um, for your insights and your expertise. We wanna give students an opportunity to ask you direct questions, especially related to specific disciplines. So we're gonna move now, we're gonna move everyone into their particular um, breakout rooms. We're not going to come back to this room. So after you meet with your groups and you get all of your questions answered, um, feel free to, to head on out for the evening. But we do thank you for joining us tonight and look forward to seeing you at our next event, which is next Thursday, um, Personal Statement CV Writing Workshop. So if you um, can bear with us for just one moment, you'll all start moving into the breakout rooms.